In the late 1800s, London's East End was the gutter of Victorian society. Districts such as Whitechapel and Spitalfields were poverty-stricken havens of crime and despair. Author Jack London once called the East End the Abyss. We're talking about an area of London that was really cast off. 55% of children born in the East End of London died before they were five. Certainly prostitutes or women who didn't want to be in that game had to sell their bodies just to get their, their bed for the night. Against this backdrop of depravity and poverty, a horrifying discovery was made in the early morning hours of August the 31st, 1888. A porter was walking to market just after four in the morning when he spotted a dark form lying next to some stables in Bucks Row. Upon closer inspection, he discovered it was a dead woman whose throat had been slashed and she'd been disemboweled. The killer left no clues, but the victim was later identified as Mary Ann Nichols, a 42-year-old prostitute. Scotland Yard was called in to investigate. Chief Inspector Donald Swanson was immediately put in charge of the case. Down on the ground in Whitechapel itself, Chief Inspector Frederick Aberline, who'd worked in the district for 20 years, handled the detectives in their searches. Eight days later, the investigation was stepped up when another murder was discovered at 29 Hanbury Street. It was less than half a mile from where Mary Ann Nichols had been killed. The victim this time was 45-year-old Annie Chapman. Like Nichols, she too was a prostitute. Annie Chapman, again, slashed, the entrails taken out, opened up, bit over her shoulder, and things like this. The pathologist who took over the autopsies decided that he could well have been a doctor because he had a pathological or anatomical background. Word of the second killing spread quickly, along with the news that police had discovered a leather apron at the scene of the crime. A wave of panic descended upon London, A Scotland Yard detective scoured the East End looking for the apron's owner. Whitechapel was flooded with uniformed officers from all over the city. Every suspect brought in by the police was met by angry mobs and cries of murderer. The police believed they had two prime suspects in John Pizer, a boot finisher allegedly nicknamed Leather Apron, and William Henry Piggott, an insane man seen in the vicinity of the second murder with blood on his clothes. In the end, both leads proved to be red herrings, as each man had a reliable alibi for his whereabouts at the time of the murders. Detectives discovered that the leather apron belonged to a tenant in Annie Chapman's building. The man had simply left the apron out to dry in the yard after it was washed. The detectives were now back to square one. Adding to their worries and the public's fears were sensational stories printed in the newspapers by journalists with their own political agendas. There was enormous pressure on the police to catch the Ripper. The press had been publicising it partly because the first ever London County Council elections were taking place and the radicals were making capital of the murders to expose the social conditions in the East End. Groups of vigilantes sprang up, offering to help the police catch the fiendish killer. 
but these vigilantes became angry when the Home Office refused to offer a reward for the murderer's capture. Large numbers of police patrolled the streets of the East End each evening. But despite this, the killer struck again, one month later. The double event of two in one night, Liz Stride and Catherine Eddowes. Liz Stride not greatly mutilated because it is generally believed the guy who was doing it was disturbed, uh, interrupted by this horse and uh, carriage turning up at the time. The second victim that evening, Catherine Eddowes, was mutilated in the same gory manner as the first two women. At Eddowes' autopsy, doctors were horrified to learn that several organs were missing, including her left kidney. Eddowes' body was discovered in Mitre Square. For the first time, an important clue was found near the scene of the crime. Police discovered a message scrawled in chalk on a nearby staircase wall. The message read, The Jews are the men that will not be blamed for nothing. The handwriting could have provided vital clues to the killer's identity. But the Metropolitan Police Commissioner, Sir Charles Warren, ordered it to be erased. He feared it would incite riots against the neighborhood's large Polish-Jewish population. Fortunately, several witnesses claimed they'd seen a man talking to the victim, Elizabeth Stride. Their descriptions were published in the Police Gazette. A man, aged 28, height 5 feet 8 inches, complexion dark, small dark moustache, dress black diagonal coat, hard felt hat, collar and tie, respectable appearance, carried a parcel wrapped up in newspaper. They were looking at the style of dress that this man wore. He was outstanding in that he was in a district which was poverty string. And people saw this mysterious figure in the darkness. The public's clamour for the killer's capture reached its peak when two letters, allegedly written by the murderer, appeared in the newspaper on October the 2nd, 1888. Dear boss, I keep on hearing the police have caught me, but they won't fix me just yet. I have laughed when they look so clever and talk about being on the right track. The next job I do, I shall clip the ladies' ears off and send to the police officers just for jolly, wouldn't you? My knife is nice and sharp. I want to get to work right away if I get a chance. Good luck. Yours truly, Jack the Ripper. The most violent killer in England's history now had a name. On October the 16th, he sent a letter and package to Mr George Lusk, president of the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee. Mr. Lusk from Pell. Sir, I send you half the kidney I took from one woman, preserved it for you. The other piece I fried and ate, it was very nice. I may send you the bloody knife that took it out if you only wait a while longer. Catch me when you can, Mr. Lusk. The kidney was turned over to the police, who concluded that the organ was most likely that of Catherine Eddowes. Jack the Ripper's fourth victim. They had a list of suspects ranging from Freemasons to back alley abortionists and a terrified public demanding answers. But the Metropolitan Police were no closer to catching Jack the Ripper. Would the Ripper strike again? And if so, who would be his next victim? London was gripped by public hysteria. Jack the Ripper had murdered four women in the seedy East End, and his lust for carnage seemed limitless. Talk of the murders filled the newspapers and parlours everywhere. It was intriguing. People wanted to... What did he remove? 
They wanted to know the, the, all the little grisly details. But if there had been a photograph of it, a lot of those ladies would have had the vapours. On November the 8th, 1888, Jack the Ripper struck again. This time at Miller's Court on Dorset Street. The victim was Mary Jane Kelly, a 25-year-old prostitute. Her murder was even more brutal than the previous four. It seemed as if the savage murders would continue unabated. But mysteriously, they suddenly ceased. This surprising development has led many criminologists to speculate upon what happened to the serial killer known only as Jack the Ripper. Three ways this is going to end. Either the guy goes abroad, either he dies, or he's incarcerated. A series of sexual serial killings like that is not the sort of thing you do five, get bored with it and think, oh, I'll become a burglar now. There's only one way this is going to end. It gets worse and worse and worse until either one of those scenarios takes place. Police desperately search for the killer as reports of Ripper sightings continue to pour into Scotland Yard. The police had three suspects. The first was Montague John Druitt, a barrister who committed suicide about a month after the murders stopped. The second was a poor Polish Jew, an immigrant who lived in the district and who was identified as the Ripper after he'd been certified insane and incarcerated in an asylum. And the third was a Russian confidence trickster and sneak thief called Michael Ostrog. I think the Ripper was the poor Polish Jew. He was named by the man in charge of the case, the man in the best position to know, and a man of complete integrity who would never have falsified evidence. Dr. Robert Anderson, head of the Metropolitan CID, referred to the prime suspect only as the Polish Jew. The debate about the true identity of Jack the Ripper continues today. The man who stalked the streets of Whitechapel is still a mystery to us.